I want to thank all the delegates to this 115th National Convention of the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States for your faith and trust in me to lead our great organization in the coming year. My sincere gratitude goes out to the comrades and sisters of the Western Conference for your continued support, comradeship, and friendship to the VFW Department of Nevada and its Ladies Auxiliary, and especially to District 4 and Post 2313 in Hawthorne, Nevada, America's patriotic home, for all of your hard work and dedication and sacrifice to make this special journey possible. To the wonderful comrades, sisters, past commanders and chiefs, and past national presidents that I've had the opportunity to meet over the past two years in my travels as the junior and senior vice commander in chief, thank you for warmly and graciously welcoming me into your departments. I've been extremely grateful for your lifelong dedication and commitment to the goals and successes of the organization and all of its projects and programs. Watching us on live stream video, because I can't be here today, I would like to recognize past Commander-in-Chief Jim Nair, who at the Nevada Department Convention in 1998 put his hand on a young post commander's shoulder and said, I've been watching you, and I think you're going to make a fine state commander someday. Then again at the National Convention in Cincinnati in 2004, when he said, I'm still watching you, and I think you should consider running for national office. Thank you, Chief. I'm certain I would not be standing, <coughs> standing here today if it were not for your encouragement. To the past commanders and chiefs from the Western Conference, Richard Eubank, Gary Kerpus, Tom Pouliot, Gunnar Kent, and John Stang, thank you for your mentorship and guidance encouragement, and friendship. Many of my fellow past state commanders from the 2006-2007 Veterans First Year are here also. The bonds of friendship and comradeship that we formed will never be broken, and I'm so glad to see so many of you here today. To past Commander-in-Chief John Hamilton and past Commander-in-Chief Bill Fine, it has been my sincere honor to have had the opportunity to serve with you these past two years. Thank you for your service, your outstanding leadership, and your unparalleled devotion to our great organization. To our new national president of the Ladies Auxiliary, Ann Pantelikas, and all of your officers in your centennial year, thank you from the bottom of my heart and all the Ladies Auxiliary members who make the VFW better. To Senior Vice Commander Chief John Bajeski, Junior Vice Commander Chief Brian Duffy, National Officers, Council of Administration, I am excited to have the opportunity to serve with you. So let's get ready to kick the tires, light the fires, because we're going to break the sound barrier and get the job done. To the Adjutant General and Quartermaster General, I want to offer my, my most sincere gratitude to you and your staffs in the Kansas City and Washington offices. Thank you for ensuring that no one does more for veterans than the VFW. And to the Department Commanders of Dream Team 2014-2015, I am counting on you to partner with your Johnny's Angels to continue the great work of our predecessors and to reach new heights of accomplishments and successes for our great organization. I have some very special guests with me today. My sons, Andrew and John Jr., both members of the Men's Auxiliary. John is also a past unit commander of the Sons of the VFW. My daughters, Terry and Jennifer, who are both life members of the Ladies Auxiliary, and Jennifer is also a past unit president of the Junior Girls. And last, but certainly first in my heart and soul, my best friend, the love of my life, 
the Nevada Pass Department president, and the woman I am proud to call my wife, Mary Stroud. Thank you all for sharing this memorable day with me. I love you with all my heart. Comrades, we meet today as a nation still at war abroad and in crisis at home over at the Departments of Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense. The VA is a health care system worth saving that right now must identify and fix what's broken. That needs to hold people properly, appropriately accountable to, to the fullest extent of the law. And a system that must, must restore the faith of the veterans in their VA. The nation lost the previous VA secretary primarily because he tr put too much trust in the employees below him and the information they sent to him. Employees who lied to him, who cooked the books, and in some cases have even broken the law. We are confident that Acting VA Secretary Sloan Gibson and nominee Bob McDonald, if he's confirmed as the new secretary, will not make the same mistake. As an organization, the VFW welcomes the intense media and congressional attention this crisis has produced. Because attention brings scrutiny, and scrutiny demands accountability. Over at the Pentagon, they have to fight a war in Afghanistan and a budget battle on Capitol Hill. Our concern for troops in harm's way is paramount, and a shrinking defense budget and the looming threat of sequestration in 2016 doesn't make our country any safer or our enemies any less dangerous. Ending sequestration was the top VFW legislative priority until the current crisis in the VA overshadowed everything. From the potential downsizing of the Army from its wartime high of 570,000 soldiers to 420,000, to balancing more of the nation's deficit on the backs of military service members and retirees, to the impact of sequestration on the veterans, the VA, and the programs operated by other federal agencies, to the release of five Taliban prisoners in exchange for Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, and to the reorganization of those agencies tasked with recovering and identifying our missing in action. It's just a damn good thing the VFW knows how to multitask. One of the best things I get to do about being a national officer is I get to brag about the VFW wherever I go, to the troops, to veterans, their families, non-veterans, and politicians too. I get to educate them about the true definition of a veteran service organization, about the VFW's nationwide cadre of 1,400 service officers who in the past two years helped 205,000 veterans recoup 5.9 billion, that's billion with a B, dollars in earned compensation and pension from their government. And we provide this service for free. And we do it whether they're VFW members or not. And if their claim is rejected or rated too low, the VFW will represent them on the Board of Appeals in Washington again for free. That's what being a congressionally chartered veteran service organization is all about. But our paying it forward doesn't end there. The VFW volunteers more than 11 million hours annually at VA's 1,400 medical facilities. We award $3.2 million annually in 6th through 12th grade patriotic scholarship competitions. We have provided 7.5 million free telephone connections between deployed personnel and their loved ones back home. We have hosted 2 million military and their families at departure and homecoming ceremonies. Through our wonderful Unmet Need program, we have provided almost $5 million in grants 
to more than 3,500 military families through emergency financial situations. Our wonderful Ladies Auxiliary has donated $30 million over the past decade in cancer aid and research. The VFW Department of Europe answered a call for help from the U.S. European Command to send six comrades to the French coast to operate a center for hundreds of American D-Day veterans and thousands of visitors who were in Normandy for the 70th anniversary of the landing. Pennsylvania VFW Post 764 raised $165,000 to help build a smart house for a retired Marine Corps Sergeant Doug Vitale who lost both legs to an IED explosion in Afghanistan in 2011. To 25 posts along the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine for their support of fellow VFW comrades who were walking off the war. To VFW Kansas and Team Rubicon who deployed to Baxter Springs, Kansas to assist upwards of 75 uninsured homeowners with debris removal and repair assistance after a devastating tornado struck in April. To Minnesota Post 1816 for donating $10,000 to help fund Veterans Resource Centers on two Central Lake College campuses. And to VFW Post 2485 in the Philippines, who for the last 20 years were the sole caretakers of the former Clark Air Base Cemetery until a VFW re resolution urged the official transfer to the American Battle Monument Commission last May. These are just a few of the things I would get to brag about. Comrades, because that's what our VFW gives back to America. No one does more for veterans isn't just a catchy phrase. It's who we are as an organization. It's who we always been. When our founders returned home from the Spanish-American War and later the Philippine insurrection, they came back to a government that provided virtually zero assistance for their service-connected wounds, illnesses, and injuries. We, we, the VFW, changed that. And that's a true story, and it's worth telling over and over again. Comrades, I was a first sergeant stationed at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, and after a very long work day, a duty day that stretched into the evening hours, I decided I deserved a beer. The NCO club was already closed, so I headed for home. As I drove out the gate, I noticed VFW post 10047 with a sign that read, Active Duty Military Welcome. Now back in the day, military folks wearing BDUs or fatigues uh, were barely able to stop for bread and milk. So a social stop was definitely against the regulations. But right there and then, this first sergeant made a command decision that the VFW was a military outfit and it was okay for me to go inside. So I stopped, walked in, and was immediately welcomed into the fold. Thank you, 10,047. I know some of you are here. What were you thinking? The primary job of every first sergeant is to care for junior enlisted and NCOs and their families, to advise the unit commander on their status. This responsibility includes promoting retention, professional military education, morale, welfare, and health, and as situations warrant, providing a little positive reinforcement or discipline where needed. When I learned that that was exactly what the VFW did, but only on a much larger scale, I wanted to be a part of it. I was soon elected as the post junior vice commander there, and the following year I was elected as post commander of the largest post in Nevada that grew to over 1,000 members that year. And the rest is history. Comrades, I share my story with you to encourage you to tell your own stories to others. A great part of the VFW story involves the relevance between different generations and the ability to educate others about who we are, what we do, and who we do it for. First of all, let's take relevance. What's the difference between a 30-year-old Fallujah veteran and a 90-year-old D-Day veteran? 
The answer is absolutely nothing. They were both young when they went off to war, and they were both a lot older when they came home to an America who, for the most part, couldn't relate to their experiences because they've either never worn or served in the uniform or they never served over there. That, comrades, is relevance. And similar to how we greet veterans with a welcome home, we need to extend the same to the new generation and also ask how the VFW can help in their transition. We have business owners and CEOs and comrades with hiring authority within our ranks. And we also have contacts within the movers and shakers of every community. We can lend a very sympathetic ear to their readjustment issues and we can help guide them through the VA and elsewhere for help. Nothing this generation is going through is new. We just need them to know that we are here and we understand and that we get it. And that we're here to exist to serve others. To pay it forward with every new generation. And they can learn from our transitioning successes and more so from our disappointments. Right now, the VFW has 200,000 Iraq and Afghanistan veterans in our ranks. But multiply that number by 10, and that's how many potential comrades are now VFW eligible, and we need them. Because right now, the VFW also has 400,000 members who are over the age of 80. And God bless them for making our great organization what it is today. The first of three goals I am setting for the organization is for every comrade to bring in one new member, just one. And reinstated members can count too. That's not an unachievable goal. And it's not unrealistic either. It's absolutely imperative that our great organization get an infusion of new blood immediately. One thing I've learned over the years is that the VFW's membership problem isn't recruiting, it's in retention. Ask anyone who's ever been in a, a military recruiter, and they'll tell you their job ends when the dotted line is signed. That's because recruiters only focus on the front door. They have plenty of personnel back on the bases who are tasked with the retention part. Retention, comrades, is why the VFW has now had 22 years of negative membership growth. And retention is a problem only we can solve. We must, we must stop the hemorrhaging or the VFW will cease to exist. And America and its veterans, service members and their families and our communities will be poorer because of it. The VFW helped to ease my transition from the military to civilian life. But the great majority of eligible service men and women don't have the foggiest idea about who we are, what we do, or who we do it for. To this very day, they don't know that it was the VFW who led the charge to create a new GI Bill, a Family Caregiver Act, traumatic injury insurance, a bulletproof stolen valor act, and concurrent receipt, a lower guard and reserve retirement age, and advanced appropriations for VA health care. They don't know or remember that it was the VFW who convinced the airlines to eliminate airline baggage fees for troops traveling under orders. They don't remember that it was the VFW that made sure that all military and VA health care programs were recognized under the Affordable Care Act or got the Distinguished Warfare Medal eliminated. <laughs> to this day, military service members, and I dare say most veterans, continue to believe that it was a generous Congress or a Pentagon that created all these great quality of life programs out of the kindness of their hearts. They don't know it was the VFW that did it. And to this very day, they probably don't fully comprehend the impact of sequestration 
on their military and veteran quality life programs. But the VFW does. Comrades, it was the VFW that helped create all these new programs and benefits. And we still have a lot more to do as the war in Afghanistan winds down. More troops become veterans, and lawmakers keep targeting Pentagon people programs as a means to balance the budget and the potential impact on all this has on the, veterans of Form, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Comrades, the camaraderie between our brothers and sisters in arms exists because we understand each other. We understand their experiences, challenges, setbacks, and concerns. A strong membership enables us to tackle the tough issues and get them addressed. A strong membership keeps the doors of Congress and the White House open and receptive to what the VFW has to say. A strong membership also keeps your state legislators open to better ways of taking care of our veterans, service members, and their families. And as such, we must, we must turn this declining membership trend around. We need to do a better job of mentoring, nurturing, and motivating our new members to stay and become actively involved in the programs of the Post and in legislatively in their state capitals and in Washington. And we must do more to make our posts more family friendly. We must create a healthier atmosphere where all members will want to bring their spouses and children for family events. We need to more aggressively enhance our relationship with the Student Veterans of America, which now has more than a thousand chapters on college campuses and universities, to include a dozen right here in the St. Louis area. We need to help these young veterans create those, wade through those, the, the VA claim system. We need to tell them it was the VFW that helped to create the post 9-11 GI Bill now that has one million enrollees. And we need to challenge them and their post 9-11 generation to make things better, to pay it forward to the next generation of combat veterans who will also return home believing no one understands them. The VFW relates, and comrades, it doesn't matter where or when you served, the only thing that matters is that you served honorably and you served over there. Reach out to every veteran in your community. Tell them the VFW story. Thank them for their service and let them know that we have them and their families' best interests at heart and in the forefront of our day-to-day -day operations. With the proposed military drawdowns, we will soon have hundreds of thousands of young heroes separating from the service. The already jammed VA system is going to become even more crowded. And these warriors and their families are going to need training, education, jobs, health care, and in some cases, disability compensation. And the Veterans of Foreign Wars is going to make damn sure they get it. Because no one does more for veterans. Comrades, in closing, I ask for your support of my three goals. To recruit just one member each. To share the VFW story, w, w story with all you, you come in contact with and will listen. And to get involved. And we must never, ever forget the 50 million, 50 million Americans who have worn the uniform of our nation the one million who have died in defense of our freedoms, the 83,000 that are still missing or unaccounted for, and all of their families who continue to burn a candle of hope to include the family of one U.S. Marine sergeant still being held in a Mexican jail. I want to share a very short poem that has inspired me over the years and I hope you get some inspiration from it as well. It's called The Essence of Passion. 
Passion is powerful. Nothing was ever achieved without it, and nothing can take its place. No matter what you face in life, if your passion is great enough, you will find the strength to succeed. Without passion, life has no meaning. So put your heart, mind, and soul even into your smallest acts. This is the essence of passion. This is the secret to life. This is my challenge, and I ask for the support of each and every one of you to join me in defending freedom's defenders. God bless you and your families. God bless our beloved veterans of foreign wars and its auxiliaries. God bless and protect every soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman, reservists, and national guardsmen who are guarding the gates of freedom even today. May God continue to bless these United States of America. Thank you so very much.